Let's uh, bow our heads in prayer. Our holy and merciful Father God in heaven, I thank you for your love, your mercy, and grace. Lord, we who are living in these last times, uh, Lord, I thank you for calling upon us first amongst all the people of the world and for saving us and for likewise dividing us from the deceit and the sin and the filth of this world. Uh, and Lord, I thank you likewise for providing us with your church, for providing us a place where we can learn your holy words and sing praises to your name and likewise partake in fellowship together. Uh, Father God, we who have been sanctified by your blood have uh, gathered here together to sing praises of your grace, to learn your words, and to partake in fellowship together. Lord, uh, we believe that you are with us this very moment. And Lord, for those uh, that are listening online uh, with their families and their homes, uh, for all of our brothers and sisters, likewise, we believe that you are with them as well. Uh, Lord, I ask that you will provide each and every one of us with uh, the measure of grace that you have provided, that you have prepared for us. For those of us who are sick, please restore our health to us. And Lord, for those of us who are going through times of hardship and tribulation, uh, Lord, I ask that you'll provide us with uh, your measure of grace so that none of us will fall away from this holy place of fellowship uh, for our churches abroad and our churches here at home. Uh, there are many brothers and sisters that are striving to keep our gospel in the midst of great hardship, uh, that are being obedient to your word and preaching your words. Uh, Father God, I ask that you'll be with each and every one of us likewise. Um, and Lord, please add to us uh, your word and your knowledge and your Holy Spirit. Uh, Father God, please help us so that we will live ably as your children, as your sons, uh, so that uh, we will not fail and falter to preach the gospel. Uh, Father, please continually provide us with the words that we need and enlighten our ways uh, so that we'll live in accordance to your word. Please reveal your holy will towards us and give us the discernment to be able to understand your holy will uh, so that uh, we will be able to not only have wisdom to discern your words, but likewise have the willpower and the courage and the strength that is needed to uh, be obedient to your words and preach the gospel. Lord, I leave everything else in your hands, in the hands of your Holy Spirit, and I pray likewise in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Our choir will now sing praise.
Uh, let's open up our Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. <coughs> Matthew chapter 5. Uh, from verse 8 through 9, let's read. Matthew chapter 5, from verse 8 through 9. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall be called, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Up till there. Um, so this Sunday morning, um, we are continuing our study of those who are blessed uh, in the eyes of God. And there are many important uh, things that uh, are contained within this very passage. And I do have a little bit of a concern if I will be able to properly relay this message to all of you. Uh, I do have a slight concern if I will be able to do so. Of course, I do also have faith that any part of myself um, that is lacking, God will be able to provide uh, uh, in his holy providence. Um, nonetheless, as Christians, uh, we ought to live in accordance to the will of God. And uh, before we enter into the kingdom of heaven, uh, there is a certain stature of heart that we must have, a certain character that we must portray while we are living within this world. And uh, to that end, um, uh, it is necessary for us to continue to study these words and to meditate upon these words uh, and really ask ourselves if I truly am someone who is blessed in the eyes of God. Uh, uh, if, I, if I am someone who is truly receiving the blessings that God himself has prepared for me. Um, you know, amongst the many blessings that God has prepared for us, uh, godly blessings or heavenly blessings are different from the blessings that the people of this world seek after. And uh, because of this, um, unless uh, I do not have a proper understanding of the Word of God, I do not have a proper understanding of those blessings likewise. In the same way, the people of this world, if they do not have the Word of God, they are not able to ascertain the will of God. Uh, you know, we're continuing on from last week, and from uh, last week, I uh, we did uh, learn about how those who are pure in heart, and about how those who are pure in heart shall see God. Uh, within the heart of a Christian, uh, something that is, of course, very important is that a heart of a Christian ought to be pure in the world and likewise before God. <clears throat> Uh, we are, uh, of course, saved, uh, and we, of course, have obtained eternal life. Uh, and once we receive salvation, the Holy Spirit plants itself within our very hearts. And that is why born-again Christians, uh, you know, when it says uh, in Matthew chapter 11, Take your yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly, in heart. As one again Christians who have the Holy Spirit, we are able to learn and follow after the heart of God, which is, as uh, the Bible says, gentle and lowly in heart. Uh, we must uh, exercise a life that is worthy of such a heart. We uh, must continue to learn and ask ourselves uh, what it means to be pure in heart. It also says in verse uh, 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Um, those who are pure in heart are those who continually seek after the will of God, despite the hardships and tribulations they may be going under. Uh, they have a continual heart uh, that is inclined towards the will of God, and those who are pure in heart, likewise, the Bible says, are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Uh, when we likewise hunger and thirst within this world, when we thirst for water and we hunger for food, we seek after those material things. Uh, you know, someone who is hungry doesn't think about 
anything else. It thinks about how can I find food. Someone who is thirsty thinks about how can I find water to uh, be able to quench my thirst. However, likewise, to have hunger and thirst for righteousness is to have a sincere desire, a sincere yearning for the righteousness and the word and the will of God in the same way someone who is truly hungry and truly thirsty, truly thirsty, hungers and thirsts after food and water to drink. Jesus Christ himself did so. You know, when we are hungry, we try to find, you know, something that we can eat uh, right away, and, and we try to solve the problem at hand right away. But Jesus Christ, for 40 years, fasted in the wilderness, and when he was at the pinnacle of his hunger and thirst and dis and, 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 and physical fatigue, uh, Satan appeared to him, and Satan said, if you are truly the Son of God, you will transform these stones to become bread. Why are you hungering and starving in this way? But Jesus Christ did not heed temptation. He did not do so. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceeds from the mouth of God. You know, bread speaks about, you know, the food that we must eat to nourish our bodies. But what is of greater importance than the food of this world is the word of God and obedience likewise to the word of God. That is why he uh, spoke so in this way. Uh, um, you know, in Luke chapter 4, when Jesus was passing through the land of Samaria, um, you know, there uh, he, he was under hunger and fatigue and thirst, and all the disciples that were with him were likewise. Uh, but at this time, Jesus told his disciples, um, I have food to eat of that which you do not know. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Jesus Christ came here to fulfill the work uh, of God, to save sinners, and he forgot about his physical needs, his physical thirst and physical hunger, because his uh, his his purpose was very, very clear, to testify first and foremost of the will of God. You know, in this world, people seek after what will uh, quench their thirst and, 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 and fill their hunger. They seek after worldly pleasures and delights to, to fulfill that craving in their hearts and in their minds. And But no matter how hard they may run and find those things, that quench is never, ever filled. And we as Christians cannot hunger or thirst after those things. Things. That is not to say the pursuit of certain things is a bad thing uh, in every wholesome respect, but our priority as Christians ought to be different, right? You know, a Adam, likewise, because of the fruit at hand, sinned against God and failed in that respect spiritually before God. Uh, also, it says, um, a blessed are the merciful, for they shall likewise obtain mercy. Um, we are, as Christians, ought to be those who are merciful. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1, it says, Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Um, and it goes on to say that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received in the Lord's hand double for all her sins. You know, Jesus Christ paid the price for all of her sins forevermore, and that is why... Uh, there is no need for me to fear judgment of sin anymore. You know, what is the greatest comfort that someone who is on death row can possibly receive? It is uh, a pardon. You have been pardoned. You have, no, you have no longer any need to fear the death sentence. There is no greater comfort that can be offered someone on death row. Uh, we likewise were under a spiritual death row. Right, And yet it was through the words of the gospel, the words of God, that provided us with eternal and lasting comfort. I myself cannot forget that day. And there is nothing that I could, would possibly exchange with the comfort I received, with the eternal grace and mercy I received on that day. Uh, because of sin, because of sin, only those who are truly in, 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 uh, truly in, uh, repentance over sin can obtain the mercy that God has provided. And as born-again Christians, uh, we must likewise display that same measure of mercy towards those who are unsaved, likewise toes, likewise towards our brothers and sisters who are under a hardship. Uh, we must bear mercy because that is a heart that God gives Christians. Um, to give mercy unto others means that we ought to give mercy unto others because we likewise are continually in need of mercy from God. Um, uh, uh, you know, in the same way, 
uh, uh, where it says uh, that we that, that we. Uh, it says in the Bible that we are those that are in need of continual forgiveness. If I have a heart of, of, of unforgiveness before people, then God will judge me likewise for that grave sin before God. I must be merciful as a Christian. I must bear mercy as a Christian. And as a Christian, I must be merciful to others because God was first merciful to me. Uh, there is also another a verse that says, those who are unmerciful shall likewise receive unmerciful judgment. You know, um, you know, there was one person that I heard of, and uh, this person, you know, listened to the, the Sunday sermon online again and again and again and again, you know, two times, three times, and they're saying, and this is the fourth time I am listening now. I'm listening to it again and again and again the same way you know a chow uh, i'm sorry a cow <laughs> a chews a cud um uh, this 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 person uh was saying i guess that's why a, you know a cow who chews the cud is able to get the strength that he needs to you know pull the the carts and to to um, have the strength uh, it needs to till the ground. We must likewise in the same manner uh, chew the cut of the word of God. Uh, and yet there are many people who simply swallow the word of God and they forget about it. That is the word of God that has not been chewed. That is the word of God that has not been meditated and that is uh, uh, quite worthless at times. Um, and also, and also, um, this is something that I spoke of likewise, uh, those who are merciful, those who are merciful and those who are pure in heart. Uh, Jesus Christ has sanctified us by the word of God, and it is God who seeks to uh, sanctify us uh, and purify us. If I have a pure heart before God, then my actions likewise will correlate. My actions will be pure. My thoughts will be pure. Um, you know, to be pure and to be holiness are one and the same. Uh, God is uh, not only sanctified our sins, he continually uh, sanctified us, sanctifies us by the word of God. It says in John 17, sanctify them by your truth, for your word is truth. Uh, you know, it is through the washing of water and likewise the word of God we have been sanctified. You know, every day we wash our hands multiple times a day. We wash our faces, we shower in order to keep a certain level of cleanliness. Uh, and in that same way, we must read the Bible, we must meditate upon the Bible and memorize the verses in the Bible and, and uh, live in accordance to those same words. And when we find ourselves doing so, then we will slowly, bit by bit, uh, sanctify ourselves before God and become holier before God. Um, uh, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Those who are pure in heart will have spiritual, the spiritual sight to see the things of God before our eyes were darkened. But once our, our eyes are brightened and lightened by the word of God, we are able to see the things that God has prepared. You know, even when we look upon nature, we are able to see uh, the, the immense wonders of the work of God, even in a bird or in the stars of heaven. Uh, there, we are able to see the almighty nature of God and to bend our heads in, in submission to his absolute power. God can open up our eyes and, and help us see and realize these things. Uh, we cannot see God with our own physical eyes while we are here within this world, but there are many, many ways in which God reveals himself to us. And only those who have a pure heart are those who are able to see God. Uh, if I do not have a pure heart, then my, heart, my eyes become darkened. And if my eyes are darkened, even if I listen to the word of God or read the word of God, I cannot see God there. I will not understand even if I listen. I will not understand even if I, even if I am given knowledge. I will be blind and deaf and mute. Uh, and then, what I would like to speak uh, uh, about with all of you today are the peacemakers. 
uh, this is a very, very important verse. And um, I am a little worried if I will be able to relay the message properly to all of you about peacemakers, about peace. Um, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God, it says. Um, you know, starting with those who are poor in spirit and up until those who are peacemakers. These are seven different types of blessings. These are perfect blessings. These are absolute blessings. Uh, and you can find the stamp of the Son of God written in all of these different verses. You know, if you're examining a very important document and that document is agreeable, then what does the notary do? The notary notarizes the document and, and makes that document official. Likewise, once we receive salvation and our position becomes changed from that who is condemned to a Son of God, right? Once our position changes, then we must likewise live in accordance to my changed position, right? Uh, if I am someone who is able to go to heaven, then my character must change into someone uh, who is living uh, by the standard of a son of God. You know, it's not to say that I can simply flip a switch and just become a son of God. I must live uh, in accordance to that standard. I must live in accordance to the life and the character that a son of God, uh, that, that, that a son of God ought to be living by. In Romans chapter 8, verse 14, it says, For as many are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. It's not, this is saying here that sons of God are those who are led by the Spirit of God. And likewise, when it says, blessed are the peacemakers, it's saying, yes, um, yes, it's saying, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Because we are sons of God, we ought to be peacemakers, right? It is not the other way around. Um, and we, there's need for us to really uh, think very carefully about what exactly this means. What does it mean to be a peacemaker? Um, you know, peace uh, or to reconcile. Uh, these are all words that are more or less one and the same. You know, peace is a comfortable thing. Uh, reconciliation uh, uh, or, or, or you know, when family members reunite or, or countries re, re, uh, reunite or, or reconcile, it is a, an agreeable and good and peaceable thing to see. Um, uh, this, you know, the, the sister who sang the song uh, uh, spoke about, uh, uh, or sang about rather peace, peace that comes um, from heaven. The opposite of peace is conflict, is warfare, is violence, is separation. And within conflict and warfare and violence, when Adam defied the word of God, and was cast out of the Garden of Eden, and he had children outside of the Garden of Eden. And as we know, one of his children, Cain, killed uh, his own brother Abel in cold blood. And from this point forth, a conflict arose. A division occurred. Uh, you know, within the entirety of human history, we can find conflict and warfare, and violence. And those things are unending throughout all of human history. Um, and this really speaks of uh, the nature of our corruption before God. This is a result of all of our sins before God. Um, it is in our nature to be rebellious against God. It is in our very nature to be rebellious uh, against ourselves, amongst ourselves. Um, to we are, we are those who are enraptured by the wiles of Satan. Uh, and because of that, because of that, that there, uh, there cannot possibly be true peace to be found amongst the world. Right, many, many horrific and 
and and merciless things occur because uh violence is in her very nature um you know um in the old testament when the people of israel defy the words of god and sought after idolatry and uh, and uh, disobeyed against the word of god god took away their peace he uh, drove gentile nations against them uh, he drove them into the hands of the gentiles he uh, drove them into warfare and violence until they greatly greatly suffered at the hands of their enemies and eventually he utilized the empire of babylon to completely crush israel under their feet um and uh the temple of solomon that god had built uh, in order for the people of israel to serve and sacrifice for him was burnt to the ground there was no peace to be found anymore uh, this uh was a result of those who defied the words of god and also and also god um uh, God also uh, sent his only begotten son as a sin offering, as uh, a redemption offering for us. And yet the people of Israel sacrificed that son of God upon the cross. Of course, you know, the Bible says if they had known would they have done so, but they did not know. And they crucified the Son of God. And for that sin, they were cast out of their own homeland for 2,000 years. And they suffered beyond all comprehension. I do not think there is any other country or any other people in the history of our world that has suffered like the people of Israel have. And that is a price of disobedience. That is a price one must pay if one rejects the grace of God. And as we know, uh, Hitler of Nazi Germany uh, sought to bring the entire world under his submission. And countless of countless of lives are lost because of that desire. And what happened? What happened? He eventually took his own life. In history. Yes, in history you know, to, to, to overcome, you know, nation after nation, uh, those who have overcome nation after nation and been conquerors and killed many people do not die peaceably. If they shed blood, they die within their own blood. The Word of God, the Word of God, uh, tells us that this world will end likewise in warfare, as we know very well. Uh, the end will come in warfare. You know, there were millions of people who died in World War I and World War II, but the World War to come will not be a war that is fought and won, uh, because it is a war in which God will fight against uh, uh, the enemy against the people of Satan. You know, as it says in Ezekiel chapter 38, this last war, as it says in Zechariah chapter 14 from Jerusalem onward, war will envelop this entire planet. There are so many verses that prophesy of this great conflict to come. This world will end in conflict and warfare and violence. Of course, yes, the people of this world in this day and age have established, you know, the UN and many various treaties. But in the end, these all of these treaties and institutions will be broken. Uh, how can there be true peace where the peace of God is absent? Yes, of course, we desire peace, but true peace cannot come in absence of God. There is no true peace to be found upon this world. That is something that we must understand. Yes. <clears throat> and even uh, personally, on a personal level, uh, if, you know, if I deceive others, um, you know, you know, if, if I... Uh, 
one, right? Right. Uh, uh, um, even 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 in the person, right? Uh, even to each and every one of us individually, true peace cannot be found in the absence of God. And you know, I will reap what I sow. If I deceive others, I will likewise be deceived. Um, this world is a world that is filled with conflict and deceit and 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 violence and warfare and and all of us have the fate of falling into eternal hell where there is no rest hell is a place that is completely bereft of peace and hope in isaiah chapter 57 verse 21 it says there is no peace says my god for the wicked there is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. That is likewise true. You know, we, you, despite the fact that the arts and culture and technology have advanced to uh, the degree that it has advanced today, but there is no true, true peace to be found in any of those things. Why is it that mankind becomes wickeder, more, more and more wicked day after day. Why? Why is it that violence and warfare and conflict cannot completely uh, be resolved? It is because there is no true peace in the absence of God. You know, true peace and true happiness cannot be found unless it is with God. God. Uh, God, um desires to give all of us true peace of course uh, he desires to give us peace however um, people do not want to return to God that of course is a problem uh, they try to fight against God um, yes <laughs> can man fight against God and win Let's say there was a great army of, uh, you know, a, a, of a million soldiers, and there was um, another army, a contesting army of only a few thousand soldiers. What would happen if those two armies fought against each other? No, in that situation, the smaller army should surrender. Right? The stronger army, uh, the vastly overwhelming force, will demand their surrender, and rightly so. You know, if you surrender, then we can live in peace. Of course, that'd be great if that was so. But the, some still, still, still say that they will fight. Uh, you know, the thing is, people are, are like that small, outnumbered army. Uh, the thousands trying to fight against millions. Uh, and although that peace offering is given to them people refuse to surrender people refuse to be at peace of god and people still try to be an enemy of god and try to overcome god on their own if you go to psalm chapter 7 verse 12 it says if he does not turn back god this is god he will sharpen his sword he bends his bow and makes it ready he also prepares for himself instruments of death he makes his arrows into fiery shafts that's a very very scary verse isn't it this was a verse written three thousand years ago from today if he does not turn back, if he does not repent, then he will sharpen his sword of judgment. If God wields his sword against us, and we will all fall. We will all die. It also says he bends his bow and makes it ready. Yes, if he bends his bow and shoots his arrow towards us, then thousands, tens of thousands will die. He prepares for himself instruments of death. You know, in the olden days, they would set fire uh, arrows of flame and shoot them at the enemy but the arrows that are used today are not mere arrows these are nuclear missiles and all the weapons that mankind has created all the weapons that mankind has created will be used in turn to destroy the wicked. The wicked who have created those weapons will be destroyed by their own instruments of warfare. Uh, this world, in the end, 
uh, will be judged. And that is a judgment that is reserved for those who refuse to repent until the very end. That is a judgment reserved for those who refuse to make peace with God until the very end. And for those who refuse to repent, they will fall into the eternal flames of hell and destruction. You know, for if there are any one of us here who have not yet reconciled themselves to God, that is, received salvation, received forgiveness of sins, who have made peace with God. Yes. Right. Uh, uh, sinners who are apart from God, who are uh, at, in violence against God, these are those who must reconcile themselves to God. You know, Jesus himself uh, uh, desired uh, those who were far away from God to return to God. That was the sole purpose why he came into this world. In Luke chapter 2, verse 14, when Jesus was going uh, to Bethlehem, uh, uh, he, um, I'm, uh, when Jesus was born, I'm sorry, it says the the uh, shepherds of Bethlehem heard the angels of heaven crying upon high. And they said, peace be on earth, peace be on earth. Through Jesus Christ, peace was brought to this world. And likewise, as born-again Christians, we are likewise those who are partakers of the peace of God. Jesus Christ came to this world to make peace between us and God. That is why in 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, it says not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. What does it mean to be the propitiation for our sins? Right, It's when two enemies are reconciled. And they are no longer enemies, but friends. That's what propitiation means. Uh, Jesus Christ and God Almighty, who was, uh, who was against sin, who was against sin and unrighteousness, through Jesus Christ, we were reconciled. We who were within our sin was reconciled to he who was without sin. Jesus Christ gave himself up as a sin offering between me and God. So that I and God could be reconciled. That's why in uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, it says, And he himself is a propitiation for our sins, not ours only, but also for the whole world. Yes, it is Christ who was brought to this world as an offering, uh, to give himself as an offering so that we might be able to reconcile with God uh, through the gospel. Jesus Christ not only died for our sins, we who believe, but the sins of the entire world. He gave himself up as a sin offering for the sins of the entire world. That's why it's also in Romans chapter 3, verse 25, it says, When God set forth a propitiation by his blood through faith. It says God set forth this offering by his blood through faith. Through faith. By belief in that blood, I have been reconciled to God. Yes, that offering has already been made. The price has already been paid, but I must believe in order for my condition, for my position before God to be reconciled, for my position before God to be changed. Uh, there's a verse in Colossians. Let's go to Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. Colossians chapter 1, verse 20 through 22. Uh, Colossians chapter 1 from verse 20 through 22. And by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross in you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, to present you wholly blameless, a holy, 
blameless and above reproach in his sight. It is through the blood of the cross we have been reconciled. When Jesus Christ died upon the cross, he said, it is finished. What did he finish? He finished paying the price of sin. He reconciled us to God. Yes, uh, the holy and righteous world in heaven was reconciled to the world in which all of us reside. Uh, we who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. These are amazing words indeed. Yes. Uh, you, you know, uh, um... You know, there are so many people in the world today who are dying because of warfare and conflict, which you have not yet seized. Uh, you know, in our case, yes, uh, in South Korea, we say our dream is of unification. Our dream is of unification. Uh, when true peace comes, we will be unified. But, um... That time of peace seems very, very far away for uh, the people up there are so different in part from us at this time. We desire peace and reconciliation, but those across the border I seek to unify us by force to them that is no such unification if both sides are on opposite ends and opposite ideologies uh you know if we could be unified let's say if all the problems could be resolved and true peace could be forged that would be such a great thing uh, we have been unified it has been done uh you know in the world likewise um you know you know, when they say, oh, you know, the Cold War has ended and uh, we are now at peace amongst each other. That'd be great if that could be the case. But but that peace which we seek will not so easily come. That is why in the very, very last days, God will rise, you know, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom. If all the nuclear weapons upon this world were to be used, it would destroy the world in 30 minutes. It could destroy the world 30 times over with the weapons and the firepower that they have. And the threat of that conflict happening grows stronger day after day. It, you know, it, it would take a second a second for us to be in irre irrevocable war. That is the situation that we are in. But the fact that we, in that place, in that circumstance, we're reconciled to God is an amazing truth and an amazing grace and an amazing blessing. Uh, Romans chapter 5. Let's go to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Let's quietly read it together. It says, Romans chapter 5, verse 1 says, uh, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It says, we have peace with God. As born-again Christians, yes, we are those who have been made with peace with God. We have true and lasting peace, true and lasting spiritual peace in the eyes of God. Yes, there is conflict and despair between people and people, and there are countries that are still under the threat of warfare. But the greater thing, the greater conflict and the greater source of hopelessness is if we are still enemies of God and underneath God's 
wrath and judgment. However, despite the fact that we live in such a wicked world, we were reconciled to God and we were granted peace of God. Of course, this world is not a place where we will be living in forevermore, by no means. Uh, in uh, John chapter 14, verse 27, it says, uh, Jesus Christ himself said, A peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Yes, peace, reconciliation, these things are uh, one and the same. When we receive salvation, we are those who have been reconciled to God. We are those who have been made at peace of God. That peace is given to us. That peace the world cannot give, and the, that peace the world cannot take away. That is an everlasting peace which we have been bestowed with. That peace has come down from above. You know, it says, uh, while I live on the Lord's footstool, I will keep this treasure in my heart. Then when it comes his day of glory, he will take me to heaven. This peace, this peace that has been given to me is assurance of heaven. And if I have that peace, if I have that peace, when Christ comes, those who have the peace, God will take to heaven. <laughs> right once uh yes yeah, so, you know if, if you know that you are going to go to heaven then that is true and lasting peace there is nothing else that could possibly give you or grant you that measure of peace and security and <clears throat> and those of us who have been reconciled to god must likewise be those who practice reconciliation, those who reconcile others. When we look upon the cross, the cross likewise, it, it, the first it's a line, it's a straight line from heaven to earth. Because, because first and foremost, Christ uh, 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 reconciled God to us. And because right God reconciled God to us, we can likewise reconcile ourselves uh, between us, between man and man, side by side. That ministry of reconciliation must continue right only those who have been reconciled to god can likewise preach that peace upon others when we preach the gospel within this world and save souls right we are bringing sinners who were at enmity against god uh, and reconciling them to god and granting them peace between themselves and god through the gospel uh, the ministry which reconciles. Uh, that is why in Acts chapter 10, verse 36, it says, The word which the God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. It is to Jesus Christ we were first reconciled, and when the gospel is preached, right, that same peace is afforded, that same mercy is afforded to others. When we preach the gospel and save souls, we are reconciling souls to God himself. Uh, that's why in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 15, it's called, uh, the gospel itself is called the gospel of peace. It's a gospel of peace that we are preaching. Uh, it is a gospel of peace that we are preaching. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Yes. <clears throat> uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, chapter 5, verse 18 and 19. Uh, chapter 5, verse 18 and 19. How all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed us, committed to us the word of reconciliation. Right, it says, who has reconciled us to himself. Right, it, within this verse, within this verse we can see that God, first and foremost, has reconciled us 
to himself. It is through Jesus Christ we were first reconciled, and God has given us a ministry of reconciliation. Yeah, so when we preach the gospel, we bring those who are enemies of God, enemies of God, to be at peace with God. Right? Uh, enemies of God do not know that there is now peace. Right? If there is no war, but people are still fighting, then that is gravely wrong. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, it says, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are scarlet, they shall be white as snow, and though they are red like crimson, they shall be like the wool. It's saying, Sinners, come. Sinners, come. Sinners, come, let us reason with each other. Let us reason with each other, for your sins have been forgiven. The price of sin has been paid. I will not judge you because of your sins anymore. Your sins, are though your sins are like scarlet, your skins uh, shall have been blotted, and they shall be white as snow. You have already been cleansed, therefore return to me, for I have forgiven you. I have blotted out like a thick cloud your transgressions, and like a cloud your sins return to me for i have redeemed you and yet people do not return the reason why people are destroyed is not because of their sins anymore the reason why they are so enemies of god is not because of their sins but because of their refusal to repent and it is this truth that we are preaching to the people of this world yes you have been reconciled to god already therefore come and return and believe Except the peace that God has already forged and already established. Reconcile yourselves to God through the gospel. Um, right. That's why it says he has given us a ministry of reconciliation. He has given us a, not the, the right and the privilege and the responsibility to preach the gospel. That right was not merely given to select uh, evangelists or preachers. That is a ministry that has been given to each and every one of us as Christians. It is a commandment and a responsibility that has been given to us. It is our ministry of reconciliation. What is your... Uh, a job, one might say, or your responsibility, one might say. And yet that answer is should be clear for a Christian. I am an evangelist. I am an evangelist. I am a preacher. Right? I may be someone who is merely cleaning shoes in the sidewalk, but I am first and foremost an evangelist. I've seen this myself. People proclaim this myself. You know, whether I be a businessman or a salesman, this is my profession within this world. But my first and foremost priority, my first and foremost profession is that of an evangelist. There are some people who give their all towards preaching of the gospel, but there are some people who, you know, who, 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 who do so and to preach the gospel and help. You know, the, the, you know, there are those who say, the reason why I work is because I want to preach the gospel. The reason why I make money and I, and I sell things is so that I can have money to preach the gospel. I farm in order to preach the gospel. Do you not have that same purpose? You know, is it really merely so that you can feed your family? That is not a purpose or a reason for living. Yes, he has given us a ministry of reconciliation, it says. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Right Through his son, we have already been reconciled, and God has given us this ministry of reconciliation, this ministry of uh, of reconciliation. That is the gospel. The gospel says we have already been reconciled to God through the blood of Christ. Let's go look at verse 20. Likewise, verse 20 says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. 
Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. Yes. It says here, uh, very plainly, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though we are pleading, as though God was pleading through us to implore on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Right? For those who have not been reconciled to God, we must go out to them. God has provided us everything that we need. The ministry of reconciliation, the gospel itself, and we must go out there and perform our role as an ambassador, as an ambassador of peace. You know, you know we are... We are like uh, public servants. You know, a country sends ambassadors to other countries to represent uh, that country's ideals, to represent uh, uh, the, the, the will and the intent of the country that they are from. When an ambassador uh, goes to another country, he speaks on behalf of the president who sent him. If I am an ambassador of Christ, and it means that I am Christ's representative. I am Christ's representative. The representative of God has sent to this world to preach this ministry of reconciliation. We implore you to be to, to reconcile on Christ's behalf, to be reconciled to God. This is our purpose and a responsibility and the greatest mission that God has set upon us upon this world. Yes, even today, God has both arms extended out and is imploring the people of this world to return to him. Right In Romans chapter 10, verse 21, it says, uh, but to Israel, I all day long I have stretched out my hands with disobedient and contrary people. In Second Peter chapter three verses eight and nine, it says, "But beloved, do not forget this one thing: that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. But the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, but is long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance." This is God's heart towards us. Like the father of the prodigal son, so waiting for a son to return, this is the heart of God. God's heart is not for our destruction, right? His love is greater than our sins. His love is greater than our wickedness. And the price of our sins have already been paid. Therefore, he is standing with his arms outstretched saying, return to me. He is waiting as one day is as a thousand years and as a thousand years as one day, waiting for us to repent and to return to him. In, in, in Job chapter 22, verse 21, it says, Now acquaint yourself with him and be at peace. And if you do so, thereby good will come to you. When you reconcile yourselves to God, then good will come to you. Then God will give us everlasting comfort and peace. But yet people still say, I do not want it. People say, I do not want it, I do not desire it. In Isaiah chapter 45, it says, Look to me and be saved all the ends of the earth. And yet people still say, I do not want it. I do not want to be reconciled to Christ or to anybody. I just want to die of my sins. You know, if let's say, let's say the entire family was saved except the husband. <clears throat> and, 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 you know, and the entire family is evangelizing to the husband, but the husband is stubborn and says, I don't care if all of you go to heaven, I will gladly go to hell. You know, someone ought not to speak about heaven and hell in such a rash manner, saying there is no heaven, no God. You know, with what assurance can you say those things? Uh, there was th This happened uh, uh, in a family that I knew in Tegu a long time ago. The husband... Uh, eventually got cancer. Uh, he was terminally ill of cancer, and at his deathbed he cried, and he said, I am sorry that I have done so. And uh, at his deathbed he, he received salvation and uh, wrote to his uh, family members imploring them to be saved. 
Of course, it's a thankful thing that he was able to submit himself to the gospel right before he died. But there are some people who will still test through their separate ways. Um, right. Uh, you know, uh, when Christ was crucified upon the cross, only one of the criminals was saved. The other criminal remained stubborn. The other criminal continued to cry out, saying, If you are a son of God, if you are truly Christ, and save yourself and us. He did not repent in accordance to his foolishness. This was a golden opportunity. The Savior, his Savior, was right next to him, a representative of sinners. And in fact, he was being crucified for himself. But he refused to repent. We are those who must preach a ministry of reconciliation. We must preach the gospel so that the people of this world can be reconciled and there must likewise be reconciliation within the family. Yes, if, uh, if, if uh, a Christian is uncomfortable within the family, if a husband and a wife are in constant conflict because of evangelism, if a parent and a child are in conflict and disarray it's it is a uh, it is it is not a peaceable place to be in a family must be reconciled to one another through the gospel and through christ only for those who have been reconciled right or, or only for those who have been saved first rather um, have the responsibility to reconcile the fi their, their family members. Reconciliation is not something that happens automatically. Born-again Christians must with patience, must with prayer, continually preach the gospel, continually testify of the word of God. Uh, because it is a difficult thing just to save one soul before God. You know, if you have a husband who is still yet unsaved, uh, uh, Right, right. Um, you, you, you know, you know. It, it is because the reason why your heart is uncomfortable in the family is because, uh, you know, he or she, your husband or your wife, has not yet received the gospel. And even if you hear uh, things that you would not rather hear, even if uh, your husband and your wife ridicules you and rebukes you, you must continue to evangelize so that that peace can be forged. That is your responsibility. That is what you must do. <clears throat> you know, if a husband and a wife are in continual conflict, do you know what is, uh, wh wh who bears a grunt of, of all of that conflict? It's the children. They come to have a grave scar when they see that happen before them. Or they learn from that, and perhaps when they have husbands and wives of their own, they will do the same to their own spouses. You know, you know, or, or some people might, some kids might even say, when I see my mother or my father fight, I don't want to get married. I, in fact, heard this from someone. Or, 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 or they, you know, saying, you know, that's not something I inherited display that same conflict themselves. They do the same thing themselves. In the same way sin uh, passed from generation to generation, and maybe you know they've received that gene or that DNA for conflict or fighting, they do the same with their own families and their own children. A family is a church. There must first be peace within the family. And, you know, there's a saying uh, that says, uh, it doesn't really translate well to English, but it's a Chinese saying that says, when the family is saved, then it, it, then it will be at peace and all things will end well. Let's say, um, you know, there was a fight between a husband and wife in the early morning. And uh, that husband was on the way to work. And there was a... I saw a puppy just sleeping in the ground, and he just kicked the puppy in anger. Ooh. And the, the, and the, and the puppy snarled and uh, bit uh, someone who was passing by. Now a problem arose. Problem arose, yes. 
right? A little conflict can end up inciting an entire war. That is why. That is why. <clears throat> peace in the family must be made. But in order for peace in the family must be made, and a peace in the family is not made or forged because, you know, one lives in a good house, because uh, one lives in abundance of money and food, uh, because one is affluent and rich. That is not what brings true peace. In Proverbs chapter 17, verse 1, it says, Better is a dry morsel with quietness than a house full of feasting with strife. Uh, better is a dry morsel, just a tiny dry bit of bread, than a house full of feasting with strife. Yes, it is much better to just have a little bit of bit of food than to be in a mansion full of strife. In fact, it might even be better to live alone in such a place. Um, conflict results in a grave and lasting scar uh, to the point of really death you know uh, you know you, you know the the, the, the people uh, you know we, when you think about that dry morsel of bread which is ignored by the world being Christ it is that little tiny morsel of bread that brings true and lasting peace uh, you know Jesus my Lord for you reside within it is enough with you alone it's the hymnal that says that, whether I be poor or, or, or whatever situation I may be in, I have no need to complain because I have Christ. I have been forgiven. It is enough with you alone. In order for peace in the family, a husband and a wife uh, ought not to fight, of course. And you can't have favoritism either. You know, you know what that is. You know, Esau and Jacob uh, were twins. But uh, when the older brother sought to kill the younger, Jacob ran away. What well, was the reason why? Because the father, the father, uh, you know, loved the first part. But let's be honest, they were twins. They were only born a couple of seconds apart or minutes apart. Um, you know, he had, uh, the son, the father would always eat the food, the stew, the prepared by uh, you know, Esau and be, oh, you are my son, my son. But Jacob was a feminine man and he stayed indoors or in the tents rather uh, uh, with uh, <coughs> his mother, you know, you know, helping the household chores and nursing the fire. <laughs> you can kind of imagine the picture and the mother would love uh, Jacob. Uh, the love was divided. There was favoritism on both sides. And the end result of that, we know very well in the Bible. The younger brother deceived the older brother, and the older brother sought to kill the younger. And for 20 years, they could not meet. For 20 years, they were separated. It's favoritism can cause brothers to fight against each other. And also, uh, within the church, likewise, the church likewise is a gathering of born-again Christians, and that is why the, born, uh, the church must be at peace. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Right. What it means here when it says we regard no one according to the flesh, what this means quite plainly is this. Whether that person is very well learned or not learned, whether that person is very poor or not poor, handsome or not handsome, pretty or not pretty, these are all conditions in accordance to the flesh. But the flesh is a passing thing. It will, this, it will go away in but a moment. It is not eternal. In, in, in Proverbs chapter 31, verse 30, it says, Charm is beautiful and beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. You know, a handsome face is merely on the outside. God is he who looks within. Young adults likewise... 
You know, I always look at three things. First and foremost, is their faith certain? And of course, do they have a kind character and disposition? Are they faithful and honest in their life? These are pillars, really, and everything else what their family is like or how much money they have or what job they have or what, uh, you know, what, what schooling they have received are mere options. Uh, if they have it, that's great. If they don't, it doesn't really matter. But they seek those important pillars elsewhere. They must be pretty. They must be handsome. Uh, they must come from a, a school. Uh, their family must be this and that. And... They look at those things first, and they are unable to see the person within. Uh, you know, beauty is passing. Beauty is passing. Uh, and, and the person that is within will be duly revealed. You know, just because you are pretty doesn't mean, uh, you know, doesn't mean you are, uh, you, you know, you are a girl. You have to be pretty within as well. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's uh, true to some extent, right? Um, you know, just because you're pretty doesn't mean everything. You must have a, a pretty heart. And it's the same for men likewise, brothers likewise. But why is it that people within this world seek to judge people in accordance to the flesh, even within the church? This, is, this, is, this, is, this can't be seen, and that is gravely wrong if that is indeed the case. Um, yes, Christ, uh, no, for we have known Christ according to... The flesh. If you know Christ according to the flesh, then what is Jesus? Jesus is the son of a carpenter from Nazareth, from a very, very poor family, um, uh, from from a family and from a background who is completely unlearned. And he had, you know, a bunch of uh, uh, disciples who were mostly fishermen and tax collectors. That's why the Jewish people completely disregarded him and disrespected him. You know, if we were to draw the face of Jesus, we'd draw him as a beautiful man. But was he a beautiful man in appearance? You know, Apostle Paul was a, was a, was a great apostle, but I do not think his, his stature was that great to behold. He was impaired in his body. Um, he had a he had a thorn of the flesh. He says, "I think from a physical perspective, there was not much to see in Apostle Paul." And yet, is that what we ought to be doing? In Christ, it says, "We are of a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We are those who have been renewed through Christ Jesus." Right? It is what is within that is of far greater importance. You know, when you do get married, um, if you seek after, you know, what is outside, <coughs> you can, um, it, uh, you can fall into a, a relationship that may end in failure, um, because that is not your priority, and that ought not to be your priority. Uh, nonetheless, <coughs> yes. Um, there cannot be any case in which one judges or neglects because of these fleshly conditions. Uh, in order to reconcile ourselves to our brothers and sisters, then we cannot be loud. Uh, in order to be at peace with our brothers and sisters, we cannot attest to our own opinion and be impersonal. Because if that happens, then conflict will arise very, very naturally. Where you know we are those who ought to be at peace with one another, but these are things will that will not bring peace but a sword. And in the background of conflict is, of course, Satan himself. Uh, from the very place of the Garden of Eden, he drove conflict and sin. He drove brother against brother, Cain against Abel. All war and all conflict comes from the mind and devising of Satan himself. In Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, it says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, uh, you... Uh, you, how you were cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. Yes, this, this is Satan. This is Lucifer. The world, you know, uh, um, uh, the world as it is today, filled with 
conflict and deceit and bloodshed and warfare is indeed Satan's devising. Satan's devising. You know, when the bonds of peace and brotherhood are broken between countries, between uh, friends, between families, that is Satan's doing. It is Satan himself. And even amongst brothers and sisters, they can be used by Satan. Instead of being used by God, Christians can be used by Satan. That is something one must consider before even one knows or can hope to understand. It is Satan who divides. And when it comes to division, Satan is very, very good at it. He makes Christians fight over very, very small things, insignificant things. He drives conflict between brothers and sisters over tiny little things. Is that a good thing? It would be far better for us to, would not, It'd be better for us to bear patiently with one another for the sake of peace. There was a husband uh, uh, who went to a far away, um, uh, what do you call it, a business trip. And he came home and he found his wife sleeping with another man. And the man was, uh, had, a, had, a, had a crew cut and he was thinking... Oh my gosh, you know, while I'm away, my wife has done these horrible, deceitful things. And he went to the kitchen and he took out a knife to kill them. And then he thought to himself, he thought to himself, Oh, I need to wait. I need to be patient. And I, I, I must bear patiently. I must. I must. I must not act rashly. And 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 uh, he and in the early hours of the morning. He found that the man that he had thought had slept with his wife was not a, 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 another man, but was in fact his brother-in-law. His, his brother-in-law had gone to the temple, uh, you know, seeking to become a monk and shave his head, and had returned home to his sister's house uh, to greet his sister. If he had cleaved both of them to death, what would have happened? He would have been well, sent to jail, rightly so. You know, you can just wait just a little bit, just a couple of seconds, but because they are unable to do so, people kill each other and do horrific things to each other. We are mere beasts. We are like beasts because of our inability to do so. In Romans chapter 15, verse 2 and 3, it says, Let each of us please his neighbor, let each of us please his neighbor for good, leading to edification, for even Christ did not please himself. Christ did not seek to please himself when he came to this world. Let us each please his neighbor for good, leading to edification, it says. There are those people who are self-centered. And self-centered people are people that, that are very, very hard to make peace with. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 18 says, If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peacefully, live peaceably with all men. Right? We uh, live peaceably with all men. In Mark chapter 9, verse 50, it says, Have salt in yourselves and have peace with one another. Have salt in yourselves. What does this mean? Salt itself is, um, uh, you know, you know when you try, when you make kimchi, uh, right? When you when you, right? When you, you when you pour the salt into the cabbage, it becomes very soft, and it, it gives the, the cabbage flavor. <laughs> uh, to make piece of salt means to. Right. Uh, how does salt make its taste? Salt has to melt. Without salt, you know, would kimchi be good? Or well, not just kimchi. Let's be honest. Any other food, any food needs salt to be good, right? But if it loses its taste, then what use is it? Salt is worthless without taste. But in order for salt to give its taste, it must melt. It must melt. I must deny myself, All right? Right, right. You know, if 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 there if the kimchi is really good, I don't know how relatable this is to all of you. But if kimchi is really good, do you praise the kimchi or the salt? You praise the kimchi for being good kimchi, right? It doesn't matter if uh, who receives the praise or not. Um, 
to seek after the benefit of others, to sacrifice yourself, uh, through these people, peace is forged. Yes. Um, you know, in order for grain to become flour, it must be, uh, it must be ground uh, to flour. And we likewise must be ground together in order for us to deny ourselves and to be united together as one. In order for us to come together into unity, I must cast aside my own stubbornness, my own idea, my own ideas, my own thoughts. Uh, I must cast these things aside for my own brethren, for the benefit of the brothers and sisters, for the benefit of the church. I must cast myself aside. You know, I must cast myself aside. You know, love endures all. Um, it says in the Bible. And that is why through the sacrifice of salt, for example, peace can be forged. In Psalm 133, it says, uh, we know verses 1 and 2, Psalm 133, verses 1 and 2, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Behold... How good, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. How good is it for brethren to dwell together in unity. The Holy Spirit binds us together as one, and we must strive to keep the unity of the church, you know, there are times when, yes, you know, brothers and sisters can be in unity, but something happens and suddenly, you know, oh, I don't want to see this brother or that sister, and they leave the church or the fellowship because of that. And, you know, someone like that, they can't live a proper Christian life if that is so. You know, I say this to anyone who wants to leave the church because of some sort of problem that has arisen. If you're going to leave the church, then... Right? If there is something that our church is teaching that is definitely wrong, by all means, you know, leave if that is indeed the case. But if that is not the case, then there is no reason, no reason why I should ever leave the church. If the church is where Christ dwells, there is no reason why one should ever leave the church. You know, when the people of Israel left uh, the land of Egypt, the, and there were many, many problems, there were many, many conflicts, but did God leave them? No, Moses was with them, God was with them, he led them with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He rained down manna from heaven and quails, he brought quail through the wind. He was with them constantly, even despite their conflict and despite their grumblings and despite their many, many complaints against God. Uh, you know, I cannot let little petty things divide my heart between brothers and sisters. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 15, it says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you were called in one body, and be thankful. Yes, let the peace of God rule in your hearts, it says. It is for that peace we were called together to be of one body, right? We were those who were reconciled to God first as born-again Christians. And it is only through those who are born-again Christians, it is only with born-again Christians we can likewise be truly at peace. We have been bound together by the Holy Spirit. We are dwelling within the body of Christ, which is the church. We cannot forget the fact that we are indeed in this place, that we are dwelling within the peace given to us by God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Yes. This verse, this verse, 
you know, you know, you know, how, how can I affirm, you know, that I am a son of God? How can I see that stamp, that, that notary stamp that affirms, that affirms this to be true? You know, as born-again Christians, we can enter into the kingdom of heaven. We can go uh, into the kingdom of heaven. But if this is so, then I must live a life that is befitting that of a son of God. And first and foremost, what that means is to be a peacemaker, is to be a peacemaker, because we are now sons of God, we must be peaceable. We must not attest, we must attest after the love of God and not my own love and my own desire. We must attest after the peace of God. Right? Uh, in John chapter 5, it says, For as the Father raised the dead and gives life to them, so the Son gives life to whom he will. What are, what are we to do? What ought we to do then? Should we continue to attest after my own stubbornness and my own ways and not care what the church says and I just go on uh, in accordance to my own way and my own accord? No, I will put myself between, between, uh, between God and others. I will be that which divides. I cannot, I shall not do so. I must set my stubbornness aside. I must place others above me, and I must continually strive to be at peace and to reconcile uh, myself to brothers and sisters. That is when God can look upon us and be able to say, Behold how good and how pleasant it is uh, to be a uh, brethren dwelling together in unity, to let the dew of her mind, which passes through the head, dripping down to the very edge of his garments. That particular expression, like the like the like the dew of Hermon, uh, the oil that's the dew of Hermon dripping down to the beard, even to the edge of his garments, right? It like when the oil is placed upon the head, the anointing oil of a of a high priest, it drips, you know, down upon the head to the ears, to the very edge of the beard, and down upon the garments. You know, the garments uh, of the high priest has twelve uh, uh, twelve. Um, Precious stone signifying the twelve tribes of Israel. It drips upon the entirety of the twelve tribes of Israel. Right, that that oil spreads upon uh, the entire church. That oil signifies the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit which unites. It is the Holy Spirit which sanctifies. It is the Holy Spirit which likewise reconciles. And we cannot be that which interferes with the Holy Spirit. That unity is something that we must strive to keep and likewise protect. Right. Uh, the reason why we, we can confirm we are sons of God, um, because as Christians, if I truly am a Christian, if I truly am a son of God, if I truly am born again, then that means that I have reconciled myself to God. Right? In 1 John chapter 3, verse 14, it says, We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. We are those who have been passed from death to life. How do we know this? How do we know this? It is through love. It is love which unites. It is love which is amongst brothers and sisters. When a man and a woman fall in love, they become of one body. Yes, yes, however, if that love is broken, they can be torn apart and not just be two, but enemies. Uh, in First <coughs> uh, uh, John chapter 1, verse 3, it says, um, uh, that which we have seen and heard and we declare to you that you may have fellowship of us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and the Son, uh, Jesus Christ. Right? It is through our, our salvation we can now have fellowship with God and likewise have fellowship with brothers and sisters. Um, we, our fellowship is with our Father and the Son, Jesus Christ. This fellowship is not merely a worldly fellowship. It is a godly fellowship that has been forged to the blood of Christ. Even within a family, in order for you know peace to be established within a family, one must be of understanding. One must be of continual understanding 
and continual measures of sacrifice in order for that, that, that peace to be maintained. The same is likewise true within the church. In order for us to preach the gospel, the same is likewise true. No matter what curses or judgments may come my way, I cannot flash back in anger. I, can my, I cannot lash back in frustration. I must bear patiently for the sake of peace, no matter what happens. To only think upon Christ, to only remind myself about the gospel and the ministry of reconciliation that was given to us. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13, it says, So we come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to be a perfect man, the measure to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Right? And this is and this is how. You know, as our faith grows day after day, we can come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God uh, to be a perfect man until the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ can be seen likewise in us. That is how my character and my Christian life before God is indeed sanctified. This is why I must strive before God to be that, to be one who reconciles as a born again Christian with the Holy Spirit. As born again Christians, we must be those who reconcile to forge peace in the church and likewise in the family. Let's all bow our heads in prayer. Our Father in heaven, I thank you for your love, your mercy, and grace. Uh, Father God, we who are at enmity against you and far away and apart from you and within our sins, uh, Lord, I thank you for uh, serving first and foremost as an offering of reconciliation before God. And Lord, towards those many, many souls which have not yet received salvation, who are still at enmity against you, Lord, uh, Father God, uh, those lost souls that are still underneath your judgment, please help us so that we will be able to preach this ministry of reconciliation so that they themselves can be reconciled to you through the gospel. And Lord, please let that same ministry of reconciliation be preached within our very homes, within our very families. Please let brothers and sisters be within peace amongst one another, bearing the love of God, not attesting after their own will or their stubbornness, uh, so that they likewise will be able to partake of uh, the grace and likewise the ministry of reconciliation you have given us. You have given us an a ministry of reconciliation. You have given us a gospel of reconciliation. Please help us so that we will be able to live the rest of our, li of our lives in accordance to the ministry which you have given us. Please continually replenish us with the word of God so that we will be able to do so. I thank you and I pray in the name of Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.